FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. This is Kerry Lutz. And if you're like me, you're always wondering what is going wrong with the schools? Why can't Johnny learn to read, learn to write, learn to do arithmetic? All the things that you and I learned to do in school just doesn't seem to be happening anymore. And someone who's got a great insight into it. You've heard him here a number of times. Kyle Olson, publisher, founder, and CEO of EAG News uh, Educational Action Group. You'll find him on the uh, web at eagnews.org. Kyle, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Hey, so, you know, if if these things uh, weren't true, they would be hysterical. Um, looking at a story you guys wrote here, uh, Victor Skinner on your staff, uh, school employee on snack rules. You can't buy a Tic Tac in a Nebraska school. I checked. I mean, Tic Tacs are on the uh, endangered species list now, huh? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we have uh, now been chronicling for quite a while the changes in school lunches and, um, and, and snacks and those sorts of things that are available in schools. And we're, we're really seeing, as, as we see these changes being implemented, we're seeing what they really mean. And so we're seeing um, turkey sandwiches being banned because they supposedly have too much salt. Pretzels are being banned because they have too much salt. There was a, as you just said, there was a Nebraska school that uh, can no longer sell Tic Tacs because apparently those are, uh, you know, dangerous and unhealthy. And the school employee that was quoted there actually said that she checked and you can't buy Tic Tacs in schools anymore. Um, we are going to have a story tomorrow about a, um, a school that no longer sells 16 ounce uh, bottles of iced tea. Uh, I mean, it just, it's crazy the sorts of things going on in schools. And it all comes down to people in Washington, D.C., who believe that they know what's best for local communities and they will impose their rules. And um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these schools are just going along with it. Yeah. And I don't know, is, uh, are the kids getting thinner now or what's happening here with this? Uh, what are the kids doing? They're probably just smuggling in, uh, in their own junk now, their own chips and, uh, you know, all that stuff, right? Well, there are two things there. Um, I think that they are thinning down, but it's not because they're eating healthier food. I think it's because they're not eating the food which is, you know, not exactly a a positive development. But then the other thing that we've been seeing is that black markets are actually being created in schools across the country where kids are smuggling in candy bars and, you know, and uh, Doritos and those sorts of things, and then selling them out of their lockers and, uh, and, you know, other places around the school. And so, but it's not, to me, when you look at these sorts of stories, you think, what is this actually going to accomplish? Other than, you know, having bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. feel better about themselves that they are, you know, doing something for their pay. Um, other than that, I, I don't see what this is going to do to actually improve educational outcomes um, or make, you know, make kids eat healthier or uh, focus on, you know, being more active and, and uh, cutting down on obesity and all of that. Yeah, it's it's just ludicrous here. I just, uh, I don't know, when I was a kid, uh, I hate to go back to that, but look, I mean, you're, you're a kid. One of the nice things about being a kid is you get to eat this junk and it's not that bad for you. And it just uh, takes some of the fun out of being a kid. I read about one school district in, I think it was Ohio. They had this famous pink cookie. Right. That, you know, it'd been there for a couple of generations and now they have to discontinue that cookie. Uh, what is the benefit of, uh, of depriving the kids of this pink cookie? Uh, it was an institution in this community. Right. Well, again, it's because of the rules that the feds handed down. Um, now, I, you know, I, I think there, a plausible argument can be made that if a school district is taking federal money, um, then they will they will serve the food, specifically lunches, you know, what's on the tray, 
that the federal government wants. I think there's a there's a valid argument there. And so what we've been seeing is a lot of school districts have been saying, you know what, your money is not worth it. Um, we're actually losing money because we're taking your money um, because we're seeing a decline in sales and an increase in waste and all of that sort of thing. And so they're opting out and they're actually in a better financial position when they do that. What I think is ridiculous, though, is this sort of these sorts of regulations related to snacks, whether it's the, the pink cookie from Ohio, like you just talked about, um, or school bake sales, where um, they're now imposing restrictions on how many sales can take place and what can be in the sales and all of that sort of stuff. That's where they really cross the line, I, and I, I don't think there's any justification for it. And um, and you know, there there are some districts that are they're just throwing up their hands and they're saying, well, you know, our our federal uh, parents are telling us we have to do this, and they don't even question it. But then there are other districts that we're writing about and, and covering that they are saying, you know what, this is ridiculous, and um, and you're not going to tell us what to do. We know better as parents and as community members how to run our schools, how to raise our children um, better than you do sitting in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and I mean, next thing, do they go to airlines and say, you know, we're subsidizing you, we provide the uh, FAA to guide your planes. There's all sorts of airline subsidies that take place. Let's face it, you know, The passengers just don't get healthy food anymore and definitely too much salt on those uh, airplane meals. You know, you better start serving healthy foods on the planes. Is that what's next here, Kyle? I mean, they have the right to do that, too. Sure. Well, and not not only that, but I think my prediction is the next the next uh, area of regulation will be home pack lunches. Because um, as schools continue to serve hot food that and, and school lunches that kids don't want to eat, um, we're seeing an increase in home pack lunches in kids going off campus to go to a you know Burger King or somewhere like that. Um, there was one district we just recently wrote about where 67% of the kids are not eating the in-school lunch. They're they're either bringing something from home or they're going elsewhere. And so I think the next step will be the feds will say you know we're not. We're not reaching enough of the kids, and so we're going to have to now start regulating home pack lunches. And when that happens, I think that you will see a whole new war um, created, uh, launched by parents who are saying, you are not going to tell my child, um, and you as a school employee are not going to stand over my child's shoulder and pick through their lunch and deem it healthy enough uh, for you. Um, And so I think that's what's going to happen next. I think so, huh? And uh, that'll cause a revolution, won't it? It will be, uh, yeah. I think it'll be unlike anything we've seen yet because, um, as I said earlier, I think an argument can be made. I don't agree with it, but I think an argument can be made that if the feds are giving money for school lunches, they have some say um, over what's being served. Uh, But that being said, they they should have no say over what a child is bringing from home and, and what a parent is getting up every morning or the night before uh, to pack for their child. And um, I think when that happens, it'd be a whole whole new game. And we're seeing that in Britain, uh, where Great Britain, uh, the government regulates home pack lunches, and they literally have school employees who pick through the lunches. And if they deem it's not healthy enough, then they, they make the child um, get a hot lunch from, from the lunch line. Um, I think that's what they're going to try next, because parents are smart enough to say, you know what, if, if this... <laughs> this sort of, you know, pitiful lunch you're going to give my child um, at school, then I'm just going to do something else. And um, so I think the feds will try and do that next. And uh, hey, we even talked about last time how certain school districts takes these healthy, these healthy meals that kids will not ingest and they're selling them to pig farmers. The pigs (laughs) seem to like these healthy meals uh, just fine, right? That's right. Um, and so on the one hand, uh, I think it's a good use, a good reuse of food, so it's not just wasted. On the other hand, schools should take us, and the USDA should take a step back and say, why is this happening? What sort of, pro- what sort of problems have we created um, where the, the food is not being eaten by children, but instead is being sold to, to pig farmers uh, for sustenance for pigs? <laughs> hey, and understand, uh, healthy healthy options 
should be an option for children who do want to eat healthy. And children should eat healthy, don't want to see kids being obese, but it's not necessarily the food choices that are causing them to be obese. There's a lot of factors, a lot of other factors like lack of physical activity and uh, sitting behind the computer all day, video games, a lot of other things. But uh, we got more to talk about up next, the uh, demise of unionization and Michigan among teachers unions and Lots more on the Financial Survival Network. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. The show's brought to you by Audible. Audible's back as a sponsor. Just go to audiblepodcast.com slash FSN and you'll see they've got over 150,000 titles to choose from, from fiction, nonfiction, bestsellers, every category imaginable. They've got free apps. You can download and listen on your iPhone, iPad, Android, Windows phone, every device imaginable. And unlike a streaming or rental service with Audible, you own your book. So you know that I've been an Audible fan for years now. I've listened to over 310 books since I've had it. Last one that I listened to was called The Frackers, and I will give a hat tip to Jason Burak for that one. An incredible book about the history of fracking in America, in Texas, and how it developed in North Dakota. It's a book that you really got to check out. I'm reading one right now, or I should say listening to it, called The Sons of Wisdom. Wichita about the Koch brothers and how that family developed an immense business worth God knows how much, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. Incredible book. There's so many great books. Uh, I love the Joseph Finder books, the Harry Bosch series by Michael Connolly, but you've got so many books to choose from that you'll have to find one. And Audible's got an incredible offer for you right now. Go to Audible Podcast. Dot .fsn to take advantage of it right now, okay? The way it works is really simple. You get a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30-day trial membership. So check it out now. It's really great. It's easy to use. And look, if you're like me, you don't have the time to read as much as you used to, but if you're driving in the car or you're sitting out by the pool or the beach, you put on a book. It's an amazing service. I love it. You will too. Go to Audible podcast.com slash FSN. Take advantage of that free book and that free one month's membership now. You're going to love it. I promise you. And tell me some books that you like, that you've listened. I'll tell you some of mine. If you send me an email today to khl at kerrylutz.com, I will give you my top 10 Audible picks. And I guarantee you're going to love them. Check it out now. Audiblepodcast.com slash FSN. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And in case you just joined us, we're speaking with Kyle Olson and we're talking about what's going on with the teachers unions in Michigan, which passed a right to work law just last year. So, Kyle, it uh, seems like the teachers are deserting the uh, the Michigan Educational Association in droves, aren't they? They are, and um, and what's unique about the the MEA is that they they created this this uh, false um, the opt out window where the only month teachers could drop out of the union was in August, and um, it's not state law. the The union just came up with this rule, and they they basically compelled members to either drop out that month or they would have to to uh, continue to pay dues. And we've heard from teachers um, who tried to drop out last August, and their their request was just ignored. Um, we've talked to teachers who, who tried to drop out in other months, but were actually sent to collections um, to for the, by the union to collect their dues. And uh, now an administrative law judge has recently ruled, um, just in the last couple of days, that that opt-out window um, uh, basically was was unlawful. It was illegal because basically they were treating that as as law over the right to work law. And so um, I think that's a very positive development for teachers. But that all of that being said, what was interesting was during that opt out window, five thousand teachers, which is about it's about five percent. Um, actually, it's over five percent. It's almost ten percent of teachers dropped out of the union. And just just so everyone can understand what that really means in terms of dollars, 
um, a typical teacher's uh, dues is about $1,000. And so you're talking, you know, about $5 million in dues, uh, which is a substantial hit to the union. Yeah, that's huge. And obviously there's a lot more who would like to take similar action, but they were somehow, you know, believed the August uh, window was actually real and figured, hey, we missed August, so we missed our opportunity, have to wait till next year, right? Um, right. Well, right. And so now what we've got to do is get the word out that, no, this this law, this administrative law judge um, ruled that uh, rule illegal. And so teachers should be able to drop out any time. And, you know, um, on the one hand, I don't, I don't necessarily have, uh, you know, a, a, a major issue with unions. If people want to join unions, that's their thing. Um, but what, what, what was different in Michigan and I know in New York and elsewhere in Illinois and elsewhere around the country is that it was, uh, or is, um, a, a compulsory situation where the union dues or you have to pay a, um, a, a fee that is usually a high percentage of the dues, and that is just a that's just a way of life. And so these unions have uh, these people, you know, um, and they have them trapped, and they will get their money one way or the other. And um, and all I all I believe is that people should be able to have a choice about whether or not they want to join a union, because if the union's so great, if they're doing such a great job, members will want to happily pay that money. Um, but what we see in Michigan, where the union is constantly uh, negotiating pay cuts and, uh, and all of those sorts of things. Um, a lot of teachers are saying, what exactly are you doing for me? You're, you're, I'm, I'm giving you $1,000 a year. What am I getting for that other than pay cuts and all of that? Yeah, exactly. And, and really, uh, the union dues keep going up. A lot of them go for political uh, purposes that many of these members are, are not just uh, not in favor of, but vehemently opposed to. And, you know, for candidate contributions that they're not in favor of, for, uh, for out-of-state candidates, uh, for, you know, all sorts of different purposes, for referendums that they are in, against, things like that. And, you know, you got to take a look at it. If you're a, a hardworking teacher, say, you know, several percent 5%, 10% of my wages go to this union that doesn't represent me, what do I want it for? Right. Uh, the, the union regularly gets involved in, in social causes. Um, they give money to uh, pro-gay marriage groups. They give money to pro-abortion groups. They give money to, um, you know, all sorts of left-wing causes. And, you know, regardless of the, the validity of any of those, the point is, I think a lot of teachers believe, um, what do any of those have to do with education? And how is that going to further my, my interest um, just as a, as a school employee um, if, if you're giving money to, you know, um, promote gay marriage? It, a, lot of, a lot of teachers are just saying this is, you know, this is ridiculous because here you're taking my hard-earned money that you're forcibly taking from me. I have no choice. And then you're you're going out and you're promoting causes that I personally don't don't agree with. Yeah, exactly. And hey, it's not just teachers; it's also, uh, well, I guess they're covered by different uh, contracts. But the cafeteria workers could be covered. The administrative workers, you know, everybody in that school could be covered by different different unions, right? Uh, correct. Custodians, uh, support personnel. Uh, typically, they have their own local unions, but they all feed into either the National Education Association um, or the American Federation of Teachers. Yeah, rather remarkable. And you know, how does how does this happen? And and you know, they're fighting. They're really fighting for their lives now, aren't they, Kyle? Yeah, they are. And and it's precisely why they want compulsory membership. Uh, they want to have forced membership because they know if teachers and, and other school employees have the choice, they will leave in droves like they did in Michigan um, or the, the 50% that left in Wisconsin after Scott Walker gave them um, the, the, the choice to, to join a union or not. Um, so that's why they are so hell-bent on, on maintaining compulsory membership because they know that um, the only way to maintain high numbers is to keep people trapped. Yep. And really the thing is un-American. The whole concept of compulsory unionization is really un-American because 
it doesn't give the employee a choice whether or not they want to want to belong to this union or not. I guess they theoretically don't belong to the union, but they've got to pay, give a payment in lieu of dues that's almost as much as the dues, and they're forced to support an organization that they don't believe in. That's right. And, and it's interesting. If you look at the history of unions, I mean, they, they are closely aligned with communists and socialists and, and Marxists and uh, radical, you know, anti-American organizations. And, um, and, and that's, that is who they commiserate with and support. And, um, and a lot of teachers just don't either don't believe that or they just say, well, I, I may have those leanings, but that's not what my dues should be going for. They should be going to improve education, improve teacher quality, um, improve my working conditions, as they like to call them. That's what they should be going for. Um, instead, the, the union has become a, a, um, a, a social activist organization versus an organization that's looking out for improved educational outcomes for kids and, uh, and better conditions for school employees. Yeah, and uh, that seems to be the least of their concern at this point. And you made a great point that uh, in Wisconsin now, really, now that the uh, union can't bargain collectively, for the employees, the members have half of them have no interest in in joining it, and it's left really as an affinity organization. And uh, they've just said goodbye. And uh, really, I think that's the trend across the country. Obviously, you've got diehard uh, states that are going to fight this to the bitter end: New York, California, Illinois other states in the Northeast. You think this trend's going to carry through to those states eventually? Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, because really, uh, public sector unions are a different beast from private sector unions. Because in the private sector, you have kind of this invisible hand that if employees are demanding too much, you know, that could harm the company, that could bankrupt the company. I mean, just look at what happened with the big three. Um, but in the public sector, it's it's different because you've got people who are getting elected by the unions who then turn around and negotiate with them. And if their finances are short, well, they're just able to raise taxes or they're able to cut other, other areas um, to make sure that those people that elected them are getting what they want. And that, that's a fundamentally corrupt situation. And um, in states like Wisconsin and Michigan and others have realized that and they've they've attempted to deal with that to some extent. Um, But, you know, we'll have to wait and see if New York and and others around the country do that as well. Yeah, well, that will be interesting to see. But I think eventually the handwriting's on the wall because we just can't afford it anymore. And the unions make the cost of everything go way, way up. And the benefits received by the members and society at large are really questionable. And it's just turned into tremendous liability. Kyle, just tell us uh, where we find your work and those are your staff. Sure. You can go to eagnews.org and you can also follow us on Twitter. Uh, Our handle is eagnews. All right. Excellent. And you'll find the link on our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Go there, find the latest news from hundreds of different sources, uh, alternative financial news, political news, what's go- really going on in the world, economic news at your fingertips, Financial Survival Network. Kyle, we will talk to you again real soon. Thanks so much. Sounds good. Thank you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.